Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today is December 5th, uh, 5.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Welcome to Dr. Ponce's farewell lecture. Uh, my name is Alex Kostomelski, and I'm a former Dr. Ponce student. Uh, the lecture will last for about 45 minutes, and it will be recorded. Uh, please don't interrupt Dr. Ponce during the lecture. Uh, he will actually review the entire course for the students. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to type them in the chat, chat box and he will respond uh, at the end of the lecture. At the approximately 6.15, uh, the lecture will finish and you will have an opportunity to speak. Um, Dr. Pons, um and I will turn uh, I will uh, turn it over to him right now to do the lecture. But at the end, uh, we will uh, check in again. Um, it's really really uh, nice to actually see everybody. I see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of familiar names. So welcome, please, Dr. Pons, Go ahead. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I am very pleased to be here, although it's. As you ladies and gentlemen realize, it is the, as we have announced, it is the last lecture that I'm going to officially give here at San Diego State. I recognize many names and faces of many years, 20, 30, 40 years mm -hmm. that I've been teaching here at San Diego State. So uh, that's a good feeling at this point. Okay, at this point, all of you uh, should be seeing the, the face of this presentation. It's a re in red color. Uh, let me say uh, hello to everybody. Uh, special day for us. Um, I, all of you know me. Uh, I've been here at San Diego State for 43 years. This is my last year. I'm actually in my fifth year of transitional retirement. So the, at San Diego State, they give you five years after you retire. So I fully retired in the year 2018. But for the five years, for the last five years, I've been teaching half time and also being paid for half time, right? So that's only fair. And uh, so now this is my last lecture of the fall semester 2022. And uh, I was teaching two classes. I was teaching a surface water hydrology, the graduate class, and also sedimentation engineering, which uh, many of you have, that have seen me in class maybe 20, 30 years ago, so don't know me teaching sedimentation engineering. But what happened was that faculty that taught that class retired and eventually I took it. So I've been teaching sedimentation for about eight years or so. But at any rate, the subject today, because it is a Monday, it is surface water. And I, what, what I decided to do was to review for the students the, the content of the class. And we use, uh, you may be a little bit uh, surprised of what we're going to do tonight if you haven't seen me in action before, but we uh, use what my students uh, have jokingly called our ponds, meaning we're lecturing directly from web material. That by the way, you guys can, um, can find on the web, it's on the web right now, but if you have difficulty finding it later on, you can just be, give me a buzz, uh, send me an email and I'll open the, uh, the page for you. As a matter of fact, I have, I plan to open it completely. As a matter of fact, right now it is open. It has an address in there. It's ponds.csu.edu 221205. That's the way we, in our laboratory that we, we've been working operating for almost 25 years, that's the way we uh, uh, describe the dates because that's the only number that grows, as you know, a, a year, month, date. So if you go 221205.html, you'll, you'll encounter this page over here. I'm going to be talking about 10 subjects that I have covered throughout the course of this class. Uh, from the beginning, which is water balance, um, to uh, going through all the components of the water cycle, rather of, the, of hydrology, evapotranspiration, infiltration, overland flow, hydroclimatology, drought, base flow, catchment routing, channel routing, and finally climate change. I've always, for the last oh, 20 years, I have added a, a chapter of climate change at the end of our, class, of our surface water hydrology class. First, because it is related to surface water. And second, because it's a very important subject that nobody should miss. 
in not just the popular, popular knowledge of popular concept of climate change. We need to talk about the scientific concept of climate change, which by the way, quite a few people don't know about. People know about climate change since Gore in the year 2005 started popularizing the concept. But in order to get to the, to the uh, scientific uh, meaning or, or rather details of climate change, you require to have a, an advanced education. And this is part of what we're doing here. So we're gonna be at the end of this class uh, uh, discussing the issues of climate change with examples, with practical examples. And one of the things that have characterized my uh, teaching and my practice in general is that we balance very well the teaching and the, or rather the theory and the practice. And here I'm going to start talking about each one of these subjects. So hold on to your seats because this is gonna be a kind of a rough ride. We're gonna be jumping every five minutes from one subject to the next. Now you consider that when I was teaching this class to the actual students, we would take each one of these subjects would take two, three periods. So 45, 75 minutes, so it's about three or four hours. So we're gonna condense five, three hours of teaching into five minutes. That's what we're gonna do tonight. So uh, allow me a little bit of latitude. Let's get going on water balance. And in the water balance, I chose to describe Livovich's catchment wedding. Why? Because uh, Professor Livovich, or I don't know if, I think he's a professor out there. Uh, I'm not sure, Alex, if you know the details of uh, uh, Libovich out there. He is originally from Russia. In 1979, he published a paper on water balance. And he came up with what I call the cybernetic water balance, which is not the water, ba water balance, or which is not the concept of water balance that is in my book. When I wrote this book in the year 1988, 89, I did not know about Libovich, even though he had published that his, his, his book and stuff 10 years earlier, but nobody knows everything at any time. So it was not until I went to India in the or beginning of the year 1990 that I learned about Libovich. I came across his book when I was working with the National Institute of Hydrology and one thing led to another. And we recognized at the time that Libovich was right and I was wrong. And I meaning the rest of us were wrong. He was right. And uh, uh, to my surprise, in uh, 1995, yes, it was in 1995, I went to um, a conference in Texas, ASE conference in Texas. And there was uh, Professor Eagleson from MIT talking about Leibovitch and all these other people on the other side of the world that had, that had bettered hydrology. So I felt that uh, I was not alone in, in the support and the endorsement of what Leibovitch had said. What did Livovich say? He basically talked about how to do a water balance, but he came up with this equation over here. He said this, this is the famous equation of Livovich. He said, precipitation is divided into what goes on the surface and what does not go on the surface. In other words, he separated those two basic concepts. So S was supposed to the surface, was supposed to be the surface runoff that is the fraction of precipitation converted into direct runoff, that is the direct runoff, and W, the rest, everything else was wetting. You just wet it, the, the, the basin, but it did not run on the surface. This is interesting because there is, there is misconceptions in regards to this particular equation, not this equation, but the issue between surface runoff and total runoff, because you have surface runoff on the surface. That's why we call it surface runoff, right? But then when that water gets into the river, then there's a problem of misnomer in there because in the river, it joins with the base flow. If there is base flow, and in most rivers, there is base flow. But what do we call the, the water that is together with the base flow? We call it surface runoff too. So there is a, there's a discrepancy in there in what we call things. And this is, we mean, the entire establishment of hydrology for more than 50 years, or because hydrology is about 50 years old. Excuse me for saying that, those of you that are considering yourself hydrologists, but I mean, the, the Journal of Hydrologic Engineering was born in the year 1996, and that is from ASCE. So I would figure that as far as ASCE is concerned, it took them until 1996 to recognize hydrology as a field while the Journal of Hydraulic Engineering has been around for more than a hundred years. So that's the no normal progression of things. First hydrology, I'm sorry, first hydraulics, then hydrology, 
then what are resources and so on and so forth. And you guys know that now we have six or seven subfields in the general field of hydrology. As a matter of fact, I tell my students that at one time I started with a colleague of mine in India in particular, when I was in, I went to India twice for work, consulting work. We sat down and started just jotting down all the types of hydrology that we recognized at the time. And there was 1994. 1993, I believe, 1994, the beginning of 1994. At the time, we recognized about 50. And over the years, since 1994, we have added to that list. And now we have about 106 that are posted on my site. 106 types of hydrology. That is really surprising, isn't it? I tell my students that I consider to be, I'm considered or I consider myself to be a, a master or an expert on 10 of those. The other 96, I don't know too much about. That is the extent of the subject to which we are talking about. So Libovich described this hydrology or rather this wet concept of wetting. And, and he came up with a collection of equations which are not subtractive, but rather additive. So I have called this system or this set of, set of equations, the cybernetic hydrologic balance. And this is the way I think, I mean, this is the way it should be recognized. This is not the conventional hydrologic balance, but rather the cybernetic hydrologic balance. And it is, in my opinion, uh, I joined Limovich in saying, well, this is, this is the way it should be because wetting is the most important subject. When why is that? Because in the past, when the, in the conventional method, we, we said infiltration, the water infiltration to the ground, but the, we failed to pursue the infiltration after it went into the ground. Well, Limovich didn't do that because he didn't talk about infiltration. You don't see an I in this set of equations because infiltration, it was a subtraction from the equations. And Libovich decided he wasn't gonna do any subtractions. They were all gonna be additions, as you can see. So this is a great system. And uh, with the help of, uh, of uh, our people from MIT, uh, e, Professor Eagleson and others, we eventually are going to fully, we meaning the profession, eventually is gonna fully recognize the contribution of Libovich in developing in 1979, as early as 1979, the cybernetic hydrologic balance, as I had called it. In addition to that, I, let me just say that we developed a calculator for those of you that are interested and I st have still not worked with our calculators for this, for this uh, example. We have an example in here of how to do the calculation and so forth. So that's what I would like to say about the water balance. My next subject in line in here is evapotranspiration. And in evapotranspiration in this class, we discuss extensively the Penman and Teeth method. We all of you would recognize or know that the Penman method was developed in 1948 by Mr. Penman out of England. And then it took uh, Monteith, which I believe also coming out of England, that in 1966, so that was 18 years later, came up with the Penman and Teeth method. It is widely considered to be the most complete method. As a matter of fact, uh, FAO, which the United Nations FAO now considers the Penn and Monteith method the standard method for evapotranspiration calculations, presumably all over the world. It, it, it has a little bit of pitfalls because some of the coefficients, coefficients of the Penn and Monteith are hard to find. But yet, just because they're hard to find, it doesn't mean we're not going to use it. So we use the Penn and Monteith method uh, in addition, or rather instead, or I guess if you could say, as an example of the modification of the Penman method. So here's the Penn and Monteith method, method in all its, its content. Where I have personally myself, I don't recall publishing any papers on evapotranspirations, evapotranspiration. So I must have taken this material, which is a complete material some, from somewhere. And I took it from the um, Maidman 1993 hydrology manual, which I'm sure all of you that practice hydrology ha have a, on your shelf. The Penalmentive method as described by the Meidman book, Professor Meidman from the University of Texas. However, there's a difference. The Meidman book is not clear. My presentation is clear because I'm sure those of you that know me that I have a knack for clarity. I will try to make it so that most people can read it. I say most because some people obviously are not gonna be getting there because of many reasons. But the point is that this is a clear presentation of how the Penalmentive method differs from the Penman method. And this is equation one is the Penman method. And uh, those that are, don't know may think, oh, the Penman method, Mr. Penman, he's a great guy. Of course, he's already dead by this time. 
but he gave us this equation, which is a conceptual model. He basically said that evaporation uh, rate due to net radiation and evaporation rate due to mass transfer are weighted, are weighted by using these two weighting coefficients, the delta and the gamma. The gamma is what has been called a psychrometric constant, and the delta is a saturation rate per pressure gradient. So Penman developed this equation in the year 1946, I believe. I looked at it because I wrote my book in 1989, or prior, a couple of years later, earlier, I'm sorry. And I looked at, at, at Penman's extensively. And to be honest with you, I came up with the conclusion that Penman basically lacked out because he was playing with the equations and he ended up with an equation that looked very nice and makes a lot of sense. It's a conceptual method. You fellows know what the difference between a conceptual method is. In hydrology, there's four levels of, or methodologies of analysis. The first one and more complete is the, the deterministic method, the one that uses physical equations. The second one is a stochastic or probabilistic way of doing things. And like Einstein said, um, Einstein said, God does not play dice. But the fact of the matter is that we all recognize that the world is both deterministic and stochastic. So when, when we give up on the determinism of the physical world, then we could maybe reach the stochastic tools. But there is a distinct watershed between those two. Typically, people are either deterministic or stochastic. And, and sometimes they even argue as to which one is better. Actually, I submit that they're not better. They're just two ways of looking at the world. But there's a third world, world, uh, way. That's a conceptual method. And this is a conceptual method because it's a conceptual because he, uh, Penman could not describe it in physical ways. So he, and he came up with this equation, by the way, in my opinion, by luck. He was like Marcus, and I'm gonna talk about Marcus later on. He was working on the problem for too long. And eventually he found something that he liked or he thought people would like, and he presented to us. And the derivation of this equation is very convoluted in, in many ways. And um, I have done it for my book. And in my book, I decided that what I was gonna do is I wanna ask the fact the students, I'm sorry, that I wanna ask the students to play Penman and derive this equation from the basic principles that Penman used to derive it. And that's not easy. It took me, I don't know, at the time, and I was much younger and I think smarter than today. I took me three or four hours of complicated algebra to get here. And I was lucky that I found it because I could have not found it too, but I did find it and I showed it and it's in there. So that's the Penman equation or rather, right, the Penman equation, which has a flaw, is like I told you, it appears, it, of course it is conceptual. So it's not totally physical or stochastic for that matter. The fourth level, by the way, is to complete the set is the empirical method. And the empirical method is the fourth because it is the, it is the least, uh, how you can say, respectful because it's empirical. It only applies for a certain case. Penman was doing this conceptually. He, he wanted it to apply for the world and it, it, it does apply because it is a conceptual model. So the difference between these two methods, of course, is that the uh, penman monteith method relies on a couple of parameters that somehow Penman omitted. And these are the external or aerodynamic resistance and the internal or stomatal resistance. And if we can find values for these parameters, then we got it all made. We've got the penman monteith method, which according to the FAO, United Nations, is the better method. So that's our, uh, what can we say about the penman monteith method? Here it's all in detail. If you spend a couple of hours, you can learn everything about the Penn and Monteith. And it's all here. And finally, at the end, you could go, it is our practice to always put a calculator together. And we have actually put a calculator. I'm not going to run it. I actually ran this calculator. It's already there because this is just the, uh, the, the presentation in HTML. So I ran this calculator. Suffice it to say, at this point, I don't want to get into there too much detail, but in, nine, in the year 2004, that is 18 years ago, we developed our first online calculator using PHP. I wanted to do this and I knew that it could be done because a lot of people by that time, including Amazon, were already doing interactive web. Because at the beginning in 1993, the web was not interactive. It was kind of dumb. It was kind of Wikipedia kind of, I don't mean to say that Wikipedia is dumb, Wikipedia is extremely useful, but it, it didn't react with you. It didn't answer questions and so forth. So the, the first part of the web was 1993 was static. Then in the year 2000, around the year 2000, tools were developed to be, so that the, tool, the web will become dynamic. And then after that, the rest is history. Google developed at the beginning. Google, I think, 
No, it wasn't Google, it was Amazon. Amazon developed and now, you know, Amazon has basically conquered the commercial world. So that was, um, that was happening. And then later on, YouTube. YouTube appeared in the year 2005. And within a year, Google had bought it. I believe the cost was a billion dollars. So those three kids, kids, I say kids, young engineers that developed Google over, overnight became billionaires because they sold uh, YouTube to Google for a billion dollars a year after it, they developed it. So that's also a luck for the, those gentlemen that Google was able to realize the, the strength of this tool, which I'm sure you guys know everybody uses now. It, is, it has become the way to deal with the web. First YouTube, then calculators, and then finally you get to the static, uh, the static usage of the web as we did at, from the beginning. Infiltration. This is a subject that is dearly in my heart. Why? Because I was the only person that interviewed physically, personally interviewed Vic Marcus, the developer of the run of curve number. A little bit of history because I happen to know all the ins and outs about this. Vic Marcus was working for the Soil Conservation Service and he was given the charge to develop a method that was going to be simple to use and good enough, right? So they gave him, I'm sure, three or four, five years, I'm thinking more. He claims, he has claimed, because he inter I interviewed him in the year 1996, 20, almost 20, 24 years ago, 26 years ago, um, that he basically told me that he had spent 10 years or more doing the development of this method. And in 1954, they published it. And the rest, it was adopted. Why was it adopted? Was it good? Well, it was simple for one thing, simple to apply, not simple to understand. That's a different story. But it was simple to apply and that's what they wanted. Basic, basically, Vic gave the Soil Conservation Service a tool that they could use on a wide basis. And sure enough, because it was a, a tool that was developed by the Soil Conservation Service, US, it, it eventually got applied throughout the world. And it is a conceptual model, a conceptual model. So it has wide applicability. I had an argument with my co-author, uh, Pete Hawkins, back in the year 1995, when we wrote this paper. I said, we are going to write that this model is conceptual. And Pete, with due respect to his opinion, he said at the time, Pons, I think you're wrong, it is empirical. I said, no, no, Pete, it is more conceptual than empirical. If it were empirical, it could be used only in Waco, Texas, which is where it was developed. But because it is conceptual, it can be used around the world. And he was kind of not too convinced by what I just said. But then I said, Pete, you know what? I'm the first author. And that settled the argument. We placed the label of conceptual on the run of curve number method when we published the paper in 1996. So, and it is a conceptual model because it's not, it's not totally empirical. It, has, it is based on empirical data, but it is conceptual because it's an equation that applies around the world. And it's this, that equation, which you, all of you that practice in this area already know. And the issue, and I'm gonna spend two minutes on this because it is important. It is part of my contribution to civil engineering in hydrology. I decided I was gonna go interview Marcus because basically uh, I had written a paper with Hawkins and some, a couple of people have actually uh, made negative comments in the discussion. So I said, what am I gonna do now? How, how do I defend myself against these two gentlemen? Actually, there's only one. I don't want to mention names, but there's only one that made a negative comment to our paper. So then I said, I'm going to go to Lion's Mouth. I'm going to interview this guy, the owner of the, uh, the developer of the, of the method. So I called my good friend Don Woodward in Washington and I said, Don, I would like to interview Vic. Is he still alive? And he said, yeah, as far as I know, he said, he's still alive. But um, uh, Don said, but I don't think you're going to be able to talk to him. I said, why? He said, because he, don't, we, he doesn't want to talk to us. I said, hmm, that's interesting. And then he kind of relayed to me uh, uh, the, fact, the fact that uh, Vic had, had retired or had resigned, not retired, retired 20 years earlier in disgust. He got mad or for something, you know, people do get mad. And then he wasn't talking for 20 years to his, his colleagues out there. So basically Don said, if you don't talk to us, why is he gonna talk to you? I said, well, the only thing I can do is try. So I called the guy up and I used a trick that I had learned very early in my career and in my life, that if you want to be to people to do things that you want to do, you better talk to them in terms they'll understand. Never talk to, 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 talk to them in terms you understand, but they understand. And boy, that works beautifully. Every time I've used it, it works. So um, 
so I talked to him in terms he could understand and he said, fine, come, come over tomorrow. Where are you, Washington? Come on. So I visited the gentleman and long story made short story or my description of what went on during that meeting. It was a couple hours meeting and he basically spilled the beans as to how the method was put together. And I was particularly interested in how he derived this equation, P minus Q over S equal to Q over P, because it is an equation that does not agree with Horton's equation. Horton's equation 1932, 1936, I'm sorry. And this equation is in 1954. So how is it that Marcus developed this equation, which does not agree with Horton's, and then it, he is endorsed throughout the world? Conclusion, Horton's must be wrong. <laughs> and that is in fact what actually happened. There is a quite a difference between these two me methods, but we realize or the, the, the underlying story is that this method is limited. It has a, a total depth of soil that you can fill, while the Horton is, it has, a, I call it bottomless, it's an infinite soil. And there is no such a thing as infinite soil in reality. So needless to say, or long story made short, this method made it not only because it was good, it was conceptually good, but it was also supported by a federal agency, a US federal agency. So we got this interview with Vic Marcus over on the record. And to be honest with you, I thought I, I had done something good, but I didn't think it was that good. But recently, ASCE interviewed me for the story on how this thing happened. And I basically was told that everybody knew about this interview and that I had become famous. And I said, I didn't intend to become famous, but so be it. As far as people are concerned around the world, they know Professor Fons because he is the only one that interviewed Big Marcus. By the way, Big Marcus passed away less than a year after he interviewed me. So it was, it was just a strike of luck, uh, a strike of luck that uh, we were able to uh, interview him before he went to heaven. So that is Vic Marcus's. So I don't want to take uh, more time than what I'm supposed to take. Diffusion wave modeling of catchment dynamics. Let me spend two minutes on this. This subject, which is also at the heart of my work and everything I've done for the last 40 years has been on this subject. What happened was that I was good in routing and the Army Corps of Engineers were using the kinematic wave without knowing that the kinematic wave has a bug that it has numerical diffusion. But Kanj said very early in 1969, this concept that the kinematic wave had diffusion and if you didn't control the diffusion, you were gonna get an answer, but it's not a good answer. So then I decided to extend the kinematic wave use on catchment dynamics to the diffusion wave modeling. And I came up in 1986 with a method that does precisely that. And the good thing about it is that this method leads us to a model or results that are grid independent. I think I was one of the first that came up with that concept grid independence. And why? Because this method does not change with the choice of grid. In numerical analysis, everybody knows that you have a grid, you impose a grid. And if the grid is too small or too large, the, the, and, the, and there is numerical diffusion, then the, the results are gonna change. And you don't know which one is the one because it's artificial. It's based on the size of the grid. So without getting too much into it, we wrote this paper and five, 10 years later, we started to get rec recognized. And we did get recognized. I have a couple of more stories. I don't have the time to tell them on this particular subject. So we came out with this diffusion wave modeling catchment dynamic, which we have run, and we have actually written a, uh, written a thesis. It was a student of mine uh, that wrote a thesis in the year 2014 on this subject. So that is our contribution to diffusion wave model. Surface albedo and water resources. How did this happen? All these papers that I've written over the years have a story, by the way. But obviously, I don't have the time to go into detail into all the, the stories. But what happened in here was that I ran into Professor Balik when I was in India, over in the mess, the mess hall. And I introduced myself, I said, Professor Pons from San Diego, California. And he says, I'm Professor Balik from, uh, I believe he is, he, he is. I'm not sure though if he's still alive. He says, I'm from the Czech Republic, Czech Republic. I said, oh, great. And then we talked about things, you know, and I um, basically told him that I had written a book and he says, I've also written a book. And I said, oh, that's interesting. My book is called Engineering Hydrology. What's your book called? And he says, Tropical Hydrology. Okay, so ne next subject is uh, hydroclimatology. I don't have a whole lot of time here left, so we're gonna have to speed up in here. I do apologize for the difficulties. Surface albedo. Uh, we basically, uh, I read Balik's book at the time, 
And he was very big on albedo. And then uh, I started becoming very knowledgeable on albedo. I researched a lot. I had uh, contributions and participation from uh, scientists from India also. And we wrote this paper, surface, surface albedo and water resources, hydroclimatological impact of human activities. After I wrote this paper where we focused on albedo uh, and the work of, um, and uh, the work that had been done on albedo around the world and this issue, this, this uh, cybernetic, again, cybernetic, I like the word cybernetic, cybernetic um, uh, precipitation. So the precipitation turned out to be cybernetic, meaning interactive with the world. The world is cybernetic. The world, is, the world in nature is 100% cybernetic, meaning if it comes and goes, if it comes, it goes, and if it, if it turns around, it turns back. It, it's always like that. That is the only law that is true that nature obeys. In other words, the J curve, in other words, the explosion is not natural. If it were natural, we wouldn't be here today. Okay, so the cybernetic mechanisms of which this uh, uh, couple land atmosphere system is basically cybernetic. And basically it says that in no uncertain terms, it, say, it says that the precipitation is composed of the, um, the advective precip, which comes new, and the P sub E, recycled precip that comes from the evaporation. And you can see evaporation, it doesn't leave the, the control volume, it comes back. And so the quantifying of, of what percentage of precipitation is P sub A and what is P sub E is the important uh, is the important subject that we need to work on. And we follow in here uh, the people that developed this and we came up with this table over here, this table over here, where the albedo, which is this number over here, controls the behavior and the coefficients, the, the runoff coefficients. All of you are familiar with the runoff coefficient. Everybody knows that. But we, not, we may not be too familiar with the uh, discharge coefficient, which is opposite the runoff, okay? Discharge meaning it disappeared, it didn't run off. And recycle, how much of this is recycled? So based on this treatment or this analytical treatment, we can, it actually discrete treatment because we first impose in here the albedo. For hyper arid, 0.45, for hyper humid, 0.07. So in here we would be, the 0.07 would be equivalent like the Amazon. So 0.07 is the Amazon and 0.45 is the Sahara. And throughout we have all these arid, semi-arid, humid and subhumid. And we were able to, we were basically able to describe precipitation in terms of, of, of its cybernetic components. Drought, this was also something that we did back in the year 1993, I went to Brazil on a sabbatical to study drought. And I spent a couple of months out there like uh, in the library of the uh, the NOx. The NOx stands for Departamento Nacional Obras Contra Secas, which in Portuguese means uh, National Department for Works Against Droughts. So I learned a lot with that experience. And then I came back to the US and wrote this paper where we characterized droughts across the climatic spectrum. It dawned on me at the time that everybody was talking about droughts, but nobody had talked about droughts across the climatic spectrum, which is the important thing. So we created this table over here, this one over here, which basically says, depending on the mean annual precipitation, you're gonna have this intensity, duration, frequency of droughts. And this is a conceptual model, by the way. So it's not supposed to be, not intended to be 100% predictive. It's conceptual. It's for us to understand the meaning of the trends in drought intensity, duration, frequency. And by the way, I realized at the time that why we had rainfall intensity, duration, frequency, we didn't have drought intensity, duration, frequency. People have talked about intensity, duration, and frequency, but not, they had not put it all together in a table such as the one we have constructed in here. And for that, I got together with Rajendra Pandey, who is a, one of a hydrologists over at the National Institute of Hydrology. And he had spent 20 years before he worked with me working with droughts. He was the drought person in the National Institute of Hydrology, India. So no, no one better than Rajendra Pandey to help me out put this thing together conceptually meaning we had a lot of data from everywhere. And India is good in this regard because India varies all the way from Rajasthan, which is very arid on the west part to Assam on the eastern part, which is very humid. Uh, Cherrapanji, 
is located, the, the town, I guess it's a town, I, I was never there, is located in Chera, uh, Cherrapanji is located in Assam, or very close to Assam. And Cherrapanji is the spot around the world where it precipitates more water, is 12 meters per year. 12 meters is 12,000 millimeters. Compare that to the precipitation in San Diego, which is, I believe, it depends on where you are. San Diego County is big. But at Lindbergh Field, San Diego is about 250 millimeters, 10 inches. Compare that to Assam precipitation, which is extremely huge. So there must be something in there in nature that produces this, that produces an Assam out there in Eastern India and, and uh, Rajasthan on the left side. Or we don't have to go that far. Is there a, a tropical rainforest in the US? And the answer is no. No and yes. The only tropical rainforest in the US happens to be a little corner in Puerto Rico, which is considered to be, I don't know what they call it, but it's, it's not a state, but it is uh, a dominion of the United States. In Puerto Rico, there's a corner out there. I don't know exactly, I don't remember which corner. That's where they have a tropical, very small tropical rainforest. The other tropical rainforest, I don't need to tell you, it's out there in the Amazon. It's been said in the ecology books that the Amazon is such a strong ecosystem that it is actually growing at the rate of 70 meters in its perimeter per year. 70 meters per year means 700 meters per 10 years, right? And so forth, you can make the calculations. So the Amazon is growing, it's growing naturally. It is also decreasing due to human intervention, but that's another, that's another story. So let's just move on in here very quickly. I only have four minutes, so I'm gonna to try to come up. Base flow. I was uh, lucky in the year 1989 to do not have a job for the summer. You know, professors don't get paid in the summer. So I, you need to look for a job. So I didn't have a job for the summer. And I saw this RFP, which stands for Request for Proposals. And somebody out there in PG&E wanted, wanted a scientist to study base flow. So I said, well, I don't know anything about base flow. The only thing I could do is learn from this. So I applied. With my luck that uh, a month later, they called me up and said, Professor Pons, we're giving you the job. I said, boy, that's good. And I want you, they said, I want you, we wanted you to know that nobody else showed up, nobody else applied. So I got the job by, by default. At any rate, that allowed me to pr pr produce and put this paper together, which is, a, by the way, an excellent paper. And it has a very famous equation by Cooper and Rohr about 1963, which we use later on to do relationships between groundwater flow because the groundwater is flowing, it's, it's out of the aquifer into the base flow. So this equation here is a, a diffusion model of how the, flow, flow, the water flows out of the aquifer into the um, neighboring river. So it's a fundamental equation, by the way, and which we have used extensively. Catchment routing, and here I'm going to finish in a couple of minutes here, I have to finish. The GDUH, in the year 2009, uh, you know, our students take uh, projects, they do projects, because that's the only way for them to get their feet wet, as they say. So I gave a project to a student and I said, well, you know, there's a dimensionless way of doing this and you look for it. And he spent four months doing it and he couldn't do it. So and at the end, I felt like kind of bad. I gave this guy too big a job and I know it's difficult. So I sat down for a week or so, it was about 10 days. And I developed this paper, a GDUI, UH. What's the, what's the big thing about this? It's the only conceptual, really conceptual model of the unit hydrograph. So if you wanna do a good unit hydrograph, you gotta do it this way because all the others are empirical. I mean, the Snyder method is applicable in the Appalachian mountains. The SES method is applicable where SES decided to apply it, but they don't apply everywhere else. This method applies everywhere, everywhere meaning global. So that's the beauty of this method, the general dimension is. It's been what, it's been 13 years since we developed this and has yet to be, uh, has yet to be, as they say, reach prime time. I don't think it has, but it will. Eventually it will. Then we have catchment routing and all of you that know me very well know that the Muskingum Kanch method is truly in my heart because since 1977, I've been working with this method and uh, we contributed a lot to it. And over here we have Mr. Kanch, who is a Polish, uh, French uh, lives in France, and I believe he's still alive, by the way. He's be in his early 90s. He developed this method, which I consider to be one of the better papers ever written in hydraulic engineering. 
And, uh, and here we describe, discuss the difference between Muskingum and Muskingum Gunge. And we believe that Muskingum is 1938 and it's old. Muskingum Gunge is 1969 and it's new. It's the way we should go ahead using the Muskingum Gunge instead of the Muskingum. And yet I should confess to you that not too many people are using the Muskingum Gunge. Why? Because it is complex. It is based on the theory of numerical diffusion of which very few people still, a whole lot of people still have trouble understanding and I don't blame them. It's a difficult concept. It was not difficult for me because I lacked out. When I went to school in 1973 over at Colorado State uh, to get a PhD, um, Professor Mahmoud, who was my professor at the time, without really knowing or, or wanting, introduced me to the concept of numerical diffusion because he introduced me to the Priceman scheme. And the Priceman scheme would not work unless you apply some judicially chosen amount of numerical diffusion. Otherwise, otherwise the model will, would blow up on your face. And see, so if we want that to happen, we use judiciously the, the parameter of theta, which is the, how can I say, it represents everything we know about numerical diffusion. So it was very early, as they say, very early in the game, if you could call it a game, that I learned about numerical diffusion, and I was able to make a, a lot or cons uh, make a lot of progress in this field. So that's numerical diffusion. So I have exceeded my time. I'm not gonna talk too much about this wide range. Let me just say that global warming is ongoing. We know that, I don't need to tell you, it's in the papers every day. It's been ongoing for the last 40, 50 years in earnest, meaning more. And we at this point have not figured out a way of getting out of the bind. We will eventually, but it will take some time. Uh, let me say at the end, that Al Gore in 1991 wrote a book, which is called The Earth in the Balance. And he said that we will be doing well if by the year 2025, we got rid of the internal combustion engine. How fascinating that in year 1999, 1991, he could say that. He was called all sorts of names by all sorts of people, bad names, bad things, Are you, you got, you're crazy, basically they said. And he, his reputation has, has suffered over the years because he basically talked about clarity. And at that point, there was no clarity and people don't wanna see clarity. So anyway, long story made short is that um, he popularized the concept. He said 2025, it would be good if by us, by 2025, we would be get rid of the internal combustion engine. Well, you know, we, you now know that in California, which is ahead in this subject, they have given themselves up to the year 2030 to get rid of the internal combustion engine. <laughs> How fascinating, which means that, that uh, Al Gore missed it by five years, not only five years. We will eventually, we don't know how we to do it yet, but we will eventually get rid. And what's happening is that that's causing all sorts of havoc around the world. It's causing the disappearance of the, of the glaciers in the wide range of Peru. 50% of it is already, is already gone. And there's every expectation in the next 50 years, the wide range will be gone. And this is one of the, is the major glacier in Peru. So with that, I am going to consider that my job was done today. And I'm going to give the, let me just start to share in here. Okay, I'm gonna give uh, Alex the lead in here. So we have 45 minutes, actually not even 45. Uh, it was 30, we actually have uh, about 25 minutes. And uh, Alex and I have designed this, this time for comments or anything you wanna say. You're, I, I recognize many of our participants today are our friends and colleagues going back 20, 30, 40 years. I know Carlos is here. Carlos was my, my classmate at, San Diego, at Colorado State back in the year 1973 almost 50 years. I've known Carlos for almost 50 years. In fact, he was there in the office when I, in the student office, graduate student office, when I went in there for the first time, rookie student, and Carlos was already there. He, was, he already take possession of one desk and he wasn't gonna get me getting to that desk. Right, Carlos? <laughs> there is Carlos. Anyway. Right. I can't recognize all of you I do appreciate your assistance and attendance to this very important class, at least for Professor Pons. You know, after this, it's all gonna be circumstantial. 
not official. But I'm still going to be around. I give myself five to 10 years, hopefully, with God's help. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, like uh, Dr. Ponce mentioned, right now it's time for comments. If you don't mind, I will go first. And then um, for you, ladies and gentlemen, please type in your name in the chat to let me know that you would like to speak up. And I will call your names in the order they were typed in. Um, and I will let you know how much time we have for, for each comment. So I'll right, let's keep in mind, time. excuse me, Alex, let's keep in mind that we have to wrap the meeting up at 6.45, I believe. So we got 25 minutes. Okay, sounds good. I'll be quick. Dr. Pons, I want to say a big thank you for you, for education, but also for wisdom and advice. I learned so much from you, and not only engineering and science, but also ethics, life hacks, and modus operandi, as they say. Thank you for your genuine care and help. It will never be forgotten. And thank you for your patience, your wisdom, and understanding. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to work for you and to contribute to science and engineering. And thank you so much for sparking the interest in water resources engineering in myself. Um, you taught many generations of students and many of us are here today. And we will advance the science and engineering and we'll make contributions to the society and make this world a better place. We'll continue your path and share our knowledge and experience with the upcoming generations. Um, we are gonna do things right. We're gonna help and share with others just like you did with us. Uh, you are a great example for all of us. I wish you the best of luck in your new uh, life chapter. Uh, please enjoy and have fun. And uh, I want you to know that you can always rely on me. We are a team and I always admired your professionalism, hunger for knowledge, and desire to get to the bottom of each scientific or life challenge in front of me. You have a tremendous capacity for learning new skills, and your website and educational videos are a great example of innovation and ingenuity. Thanks to you, now the entire world is able to learn and appreciate new concepts, history, and about the environment and the issues surrounding it. I appreciate this greatly. God bless you and give you many, many years of life, health, happiness, and good luck. Thank you, Dr. Pons. Thank you. Well, uh, like I mentioned, ladies and gentlemen. Let me, please, let me can I interrupt? Or yeah, oh, maybe ask at the end. I'll be, I'll, at the end. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, so like I mentioned, ladies and gentlemen, please type in the box if uh, you would like to speak up. So uh, I have um, two, two, two people here, so, um, right here. So go ahead and um, please forgive me if I mispronounce somebody's name. Um, I apologize for this. I think this is Dr. Vasiliki, please. Uh, uh, Alex, let me interrupt you again. We have uh, my good friend, Carlos Rodriguez from Colombia, who has been out of the United States for, I don't know, 20, 30 years, and he doesn't feel comfortable in English. I wonder if you, since you speak many oh, languages- Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. You can talk um, Spanish and you translate. Of course. Of Later, course. okay, fine. Next person. Uh, yeah. Maybe maybe I'll just announce this in Spanish just so he knows. Um, para los hispanoparlantes, por favor pongan su nombre en el chat si desean um, hacer algún comentario y yo voy a llamar su nombre uh, de acuerdo uh, con el tiempo en que lo, lo, lo ha puesto en el chat y les voy a decir cuánto tiempo tienen para, para hablar. Muchas gracias. Ok. So we'll go to Dr. Vasiliki, please. Hi, Professor Pons. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm from Brazil. I did part of my sabbatic when I was still working in the academy with Professor Pons uh, a little bit before the pandemic. And now I moved to Australia. I'm kind of doing both in the academy and in the industry. 
I would just like to thank Professor Pons for the opportunity he has given everybody uh, throughout his whole life. So many students passed through him and so many contributions in the academy and in the industry. Um, besides being a wonderful person, a, a wonderful human being, uh, he's contributed a lot to all of us. So I would just like to thank you. You are going to be missed, but thank God you have left a long track of contributions on your website and uh, nobody's ever going to get rid of anything uh, that has learned from you because it's impossible. It's all there. It's part of our history. It's part of the world history. Uh, and I hope that your site is always going to be alive there with San Diego State University and uh, we can continue using it because this information that you have there, um, there's no price for that. So thank you so much for everything. Now I'm in Australia. That's why a friend of ours had mentioned, um, I cannot stay longer here because I'm at work time, but I could not be absent at this special moment. Thank you so much, Professor Pons. Um, Thank you, 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 you are part of my life and you are always going to be. <laughs> we hopefully will make a couple comments at the end. Uh, give me a couple minutes, uh, Alex, at the end. Sure, sure, we'll do. Okay, uh, please, next is uh, our friend and engineer, Victor Velasco from City of Oceanside. There he is. Hola, buenas tardes, Dr. Ponce. I just uh, wanted to uh, say thank you for everything you did for us, uh, for your teachings. And uh, it was always uh, entertaining to be in your lectures, uh, very interesting lectures. Um, and your calculators, your online calculators, uh, I still use them till this day. Sometimes I want to run a quick calculation and um, I still use them. So they, they will live on forever. Uh, thank you for everything you did for us. Uh, uh, you impacted our lives more than uh, uh, you probably imagined. And um, uh, thank you, thank you, and uh, enjoy your retirement. Thank you. Uh, the next person here is uh, Miss Patricia Karim Estela Livia. Eh, buenas noches. Buenas noches. Eh, bueno, desde Juanuco. Eh, felicitar al doctor Ponce, un apasionado de la ingeniería de aguas y que tengo el gusto de conocerlo ya una década y que pues uh, can you, uh, Alex, excuse me, can you kind of translate on the go? Uh, it's difficult. <laughs> uh, sure, I, 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 I'll, I'll translate. Try your best. Sure, I'll try my best. Sorry. Por, por favor, adelante, Patricia. Gracias. Yeah, I just wanted to, to, to say big thank you to Dr. Pons for all his contribution to hydraulic and water resources engineering. Uh, this is from Peru, Juanaco. Um, uh, Ms. Patricia Karim Estela Livia. Um, if you don't mind, we'll move on. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Julio Curoiwa. Um, do you please uh, go ahead and speak up? Hold on. I'm going to open my video. Hey, Victor, it's such a big pleasure to, to be here with you in this uh, moment. Thank you, Julio. Um, there are uh, a number of, uh, I mean, the contribution you've made. And there is a, a paper that I recall right now that is uh, the SCS number has reached maturity. That was an excellent paper that uh, somehow opens the eyes. I remember people at the um, Natural Resources Conservation Service, which used to be the SCS, uh, you know, uh, changing everything to the Green Amp method for infiltration. And man, <laughs> it is, it's a very difficult method to uh, calibrate, you know. So um, I think somehow they, uh, well, somehow, I don't know, refrain from keeping the, the model that they were using for a while. 
and I think we still we're still using SenseGo the CS number, which is uh, yeah. well somehow, as you said, it's a conceptual model. And that op that, I, that paper that I mentioned is was an eye opener. And well, I'm really happy I, I I met you many many years ago, decades ago, before I went to CSU. I think you convinced me that it was a really good school. I went there, and um, I uh, I. Well, I hope to see you in soon uh, in here in Lima or in the U.S. or wherever we can meet each other. Give you my best uh, for you and Jane, so you can have uh, more time together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on here to Luis Magallon. Profe, buenas noches. That Luis, is not how are you? Good to likewise, likewise. So good to hear from you. Um, now, you know, just uh, wanted to reiterate what I put in the chat. Just extremely uh, grateful for everything uh, you did for me, you know, on a professional, personal, and academic role. It really was uh, quite the experience and something that I treasure and I know I'll treasure for the rest of my life. Y la, son, nada más y nada menos que puro éxito en la, en la siguiente etapa. Saludos. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Luis. Okay. Uh, the next person is our dear friend, Flor Perez. Sorry. It's a way of intro. Hello. Flor, let me introduce yes. Flor. Flor has been my, my faithful assistant for almost uh, roughly 20 years. And she is the person responsible for the success, quantity, and quality of my website. So there she is, Flor Perez from Mexico City. Hi, everybody. I'm kind of nervous because it's so emotional this time. <laughs> but I'm here. I, I was uh, collaborated with Dr. Pons since 2003 at the Visual Lab. I don't know if you uh, know about it. But it was a computer lab founded in 2001, and it was for uh, teaching and research in the Department of the Civil Engineering at the San Diego State University, California. Dr. Pons, for me, is a person with discipline, passion, and commitment to achieve his goals. He teaches with positive words and positive actions, both in the technical field and in the personal area without expecting any contribution for it. Um, his contributions in the field of hydraulics and hydrological engineering have been of great importance. Um, international uh, contributions that have transcended beyond the classroom and that today we can consult them anywhere through, the, through his website, mm -hmm. which has been one of his most important projects. In addition to the thousand videos for our, our information, learning, and enjoyment, where the knowledge and personality of Dr. Pons is reflected. Um, Dr. Miguel Pons is and it will be a master in engineering and a master in life. Thanks so much for all <laughs> your knowledge that you have shared to us. Congratulations. Thank you, Thank you so Flor. Much. Thank you very much for your kind words. Thank you. Okay, we'll move, move into the next speaker. Uh, I know he doesn't have a camera, but he is going to speak up right now. It's David Edwards from Australia. A bug. G'day, Dr. Ponce. Uh, I just wanted to say a few words and, and thanks for all of our students um, and particularly I know you were there for all the traditional students, but you were also there for us non-traditional students and you opened doors uh, for us older students to, to sort of restart. And I'll for, you know, forever be thankful for, uh, for you giving us that opportunity. And we all, we all know, especially how good your engineering resources are, and we use them every day uh, and they're renowned, especially when I went on and continued my work at um, Colorado State, they all knew when I mentioned Dr. Ponce, there was no more argument. They're like, yeah, that's, that's good. Um, but more so, I think what's special is the community that you've built and 
the like the names on this list that we all know each other and it's because of you and, and creating um this group of, of people that really appreciate and understand hydrology but we, we we have an appreciation for each other because of everything that you've taught us so i really want to wish you all the best but i'm very very thankful that i was you had uh Across my life, and I was able to learn under under you and and Dr. Para, and I really respect everyone that I've ever met on my journey, uh, especially the young fellows here like Victor and Junior and, and Alex and everyone else that I can't name. But um, all I want to say is thank you and, and enjoy the the rest of it. Thanks. Let me interrupt, Alex. At the end, if I have a few minutes, I'm going to uh, describe the situation where Alex Dostomilski and I cross paths early 2009. Thank you. Go ahead. Sure. Thank you. All right. Moving on. Next speaker is, I believe, Dr. Vittorio Bovolin from Italy. Yeah. Uh, Alex, may I share the, my screen? Sure. Sure, of course. No, apparently is disabled it's, for... I, 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 just, I just did that. You, you should be able to do that. Okay. Well, uh, I simply, Victor, I want to remember, well, okay, is, is it sharing? Yes. Okay, I want just to remind uh, the most striking episode with Victor. Uh, we were chatting about several things, not only technical things. And as you know, Victor is very fond of Machiavelli. So I'm now sharing the, his page on Machiavelli. And he asked me, he had a page in English that I cannot find now, and the page in Spanish about sentences from Machiavelli. And he asked me to translate in Italian since Machiavelli is Italian. The problem was that I could not translate because actually I had the translation. So I had to revert back to the original sentence. And it was a very difficult task because it was a very different Italian from the modern Italian. It's about 500 years old Italians. And it took me about a couple of days to search through the book and to find the sentences. I'm very glad that they are still on your website. It was a very I mean, um, interesting request for you and one of the my best memory of the period in San Diego. Uh, fair wind for your life, uh, Victor. Thank you very much, Dr. Bowley. Uh, Alex, I can, okay. I hope I have a few minutes at the end to kind of close. I and, hope so. Uh, we have your, uh, your interventions have, have brought yeah, a whole have, lot of good memories. Yeah, I think I have about uh, three more people. Okay, uh, go ahead. Here. Go ahead. Um, so maybe let's give uh, them each one minute. Good. Um, okay. Juan good. Diego Alvarado Estela, please. Gracias. Esto quisiera hacer otro ponce en español por su gran contribución a la ingeniería hidráulica, un docente muy dinámico, muy divertido, muy alegre, que permite que bueno, los alumnos, los que enseña, siempre que lo hace, se tenga un aprendizaje efectivo. Una persona muy amena, muy alegre, sincera y íntegra, un ser humano. Un no lo podemos humano. ver, no lo podemos ver, we cannot see him. Un bien humano, como quiere decir. Okay, I should mention to everybody that Juan Diego is a civil engineering sophomore. Gracias. Bueno, pues alguien muy importante, alguien muy sincero, íntegro, muy ameno con quien se puede hablar y pues digno de benemérito. Personalmente, esto estoy agradecido con el doctor Ponce porque es un referente que tengo, yo recurso en la carrera de ingeniería civil, apenas voy a hacer un ciclo, lo veo como alguien esto que tiene una gran trayectoria, alguien que tiene grandes investigaciones, alguien muy importante, alguien que yo tomo como referente para poder seguir adelante y también inspirarme. Gracias por todo lo que nos ha aportado Dr. Ponce en, su, en todos esos años. Estoy muy agradecido, eh, sinceramente. Y espero que eh, le vaya bien en su sentido. Gracias por todo. 
Thank you. Muchas gracias, Juan. Um, we will move on to uh, Marcela Diaz, please, Marcela. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to say thank you when I, and I'll translate to Spanish so everybody can understand. When I moved to San Diego, I got the, I was lucky enough to start working with Professor Pons. Um, we made a, we were able to make this great group of people. I was working with Luis Magallon. Um, we became friends with David Edwards too. And we were also having class under Dr. Parra, who was teaching a class with Professor Pons. And that, um, me being in that place really changed my, my, the course of my life. So I am very appreciative to you and, and only good things came from that. And I will always kind of remember all of your help. Thank you so much. Um, cuando yo me mudé a vivir a San Diego, era un momento un poco no muy fácil. El, el profesor Ponce extendió su mano, me ayudó y gracias a él, este, tuve un mejor futuro. Estuve en una mejor posición con sus guianzas, con sus enseñanzas. Así que estoy eternamente agradecida. Muchísimas gracias por todo. Y no perder, perder contacto de nuevo. Thank you, Marcela. I really appreciate it. So we'll move into next person is Carlos Montaño. Please. I think you are muted. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to talk uh, briefly about my professional relation with uh, Dr. Ponce. He came to Bolivia here to Santa Cruz de la Sierra in 1988, 89, to study the, the sediment transport in the Piraí River that crossed the city. So we, we worked with him more or less one year, not, not continuously, but I was helping him to study this, uh, this phenomenon of tra sediment transport, he prepared a model, a mathematical model of this transport, a very interesting. And I, I learned uh, a lot of with, uh, working with him. So I want to, to, to say to Dr. Ponce that really I, I was, uh, uh, fortunately, uh, he, the colleague that worked with him. Thank you very much for your your friendship, uh, Miguel. I am happy to to assist now to your lecture, your last lecture, and thank you very much for all for your friendship, really, Miguel. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Montaño. We have one more quick message, Dr. Ponce. Uh, it's written here in text, so I'm just going to read that off the screen, if you don't mind. Uh, it's from Rosa Smith, uh, also our uh, dear student, and she writes here, I do want to congratulate Dr. Pons for all his accomplishments and thank him for all the knowledge and encouragement he shared with me and with everyone. I'm so thankful for being part of the team. Dr. Pons, uh, this, the floor is yours. Thank all of you. It was very moving, very moving. I am speechless. I don't know what to say, but what I'm going to do now, I have a minute and a half, I would say. Actually, I'm stealing one minute. I have notes in here. I could remember, because I have a good memory, the instances in which I met all of you. Can you believe that? All of you that have spoken. Um, but I'm going to limit my, my um, discussion or my presentation to Alex, because he's the lead person. Without Alex, we couldn't be doing, we wouldn't be doing this. Alex, luck has always been a factor, a fundamental factor in my life that I can say off the bat, God likes me, okay? And uh, back in the year 2009, there was a budget crunch. A budget crunch means there was no money to be found. So the boss came to me and said, Pons, 
you're gonna take you're gonna have to teach hydraulics i said really i teach hydrology no he says hydraulics we need you in hydraulics and i said sure i've, I've taught hydraulics only i don't i didn't teach it every year i taught it every seven years somebody retired or got a sabbatical then it was ponds the the guy that could move in to teach hydraulics but this time it was extraordinary the department had no money and we couldn't hire anybody. So Pons was gonna do it. So I did it. It was the year 2000 and um, I want to remember 2009. Okay. And, uh, and the, there was a, a class uh, of 70 people. I, to be honest with you, I'm gonna confess that I didn't like teaching hydraulics because there were too many students. Hydrology was 20 and hydraulics was 70. And you know, if you're not a professor, you realize that that's three times more work when it comes down to grading. So, but at any rate, I had to do it. I was, I was tasked with doing it. Get to sit in front of the class, Alex. And then at the end of the class, Alex came to me and said, Professor Pons, I like your class. What other classes do you teach? And I said, well, I actually teach this and this and this and that. And I listed all my classes. There were eight classes that I thought of San Diego State one time or the other. And I was really surprised what he said. Alex said that he should remember at this point, he says, I plan to take all of them. That's all he said. So with that, I'm, we're gonna close. Alex, I give back the floor to you. Thank you very much for all of your care and your, and your just your mere attendance here has made my, not my day, my year, my life better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pons. I uh, really appreciate this invitation. Thank you for inviting us. And thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, for attending and participating. Thank you for your warm wishes to our dear friend, Dr. Pons. Uh, and uh, we're all thankful for Dr. Pons for everything that he did for us and we wish him the best. Thank you. Happy holidays. Bye-bye.